Hello and welcome to the AMA Update video and podcast. We've got a special edition for you today. Uh, move over, Jenna Bush. Move over, Reese Witherspoon. Today's the first official installment of the AMA Book Club. And for our first selection, we're going to be talking about a new novel called The Exceptions, which tells the true story of 16 women, all tenured professors at MIT, who came together to fight gender discrimination. And I'm fortunate to be joined by the book's author and New York Times Pulitzer Prize winning writer, Kate Zernike. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Kate, it is so great to have you with us today. Thank you for having me, Todd. It's great to be here. This has to be a pretty exciting day to see your book released. It is. It's been, a, you know, I've been working this for five years and I've been thinking about the story for more than 20 now. So yeah, it's really nice to see it coming into the world. Well, it is a really extraordinary story, and sometimes it, you know, it almost reads like fiction, but we know it isn't. For uh, those out uh, listening and watching this, why don't we just start with kind of a quick synopsis and tell us why, why do you call it The Exceptions? Yeah, so when I was, this book is about a group of really extraordinary female scientists who are all tenured professors at MIT, which of course is this top institute of science and technology. Um, and they were really extraordinary in that they were, they were hired at the beginning of affirmative action. They were really sort of solo in their fields. So they were quite extraordinary people. Uh, they were extraordinary scientists. Um, so they were exceptional in that way in that they were singular, singular talent, singular, singularly brilliant. Um, but the exceptions also refers to the way they reacted when they were faced with discrimination, which was to say, this isn't discrimination, this is just the circumstances, or this is just this personality conflict, or this is maybe just one bad guy. And so they were able to kind of push away this discrimination for a long time. But of course, what we come to see is that the exception, those weren't the exceptions, and these women aren't the exceptions. There are many extraordinary scientists out there who should be more welcomed in the field. We're going to talk more in detail about just uh, uh, how they came together around that problem. But uh, it's also just really interesting, uh, the role that you play really in talking about the story, because you broke it for the Boston Globe back in 1999. How did you first learn about uh, the main character in the story, Nancy Hopkins and her colleagues? And you know what drew you to this story? So the, the story came to me as a tip from an editor, and it was very vague. It was, you know, women, something about women discrimination at MIT. And again, it was 1999, and I thought, okay, you know, maybe it's a lawsuit or something. I didn't expect, you know, I didn't really know what to expect. But I was given the name of Nancy Hopkins, and I called her. Um, and she's clearly, she's just this very compelling character. You know, she's very intense, but she's very um, just warm. And uh, so she said that actually MIT was going to admit, dis admit, admit that it had discriminated against the women on its faculty. And I was really struck by this. In my field, this is what we call a man bites dog story. This wasn't a story of, you know, they were, MIT was pressured to do this by a lawsuit. In fact, these women had come together and gathered information to show that they were being discriminated against. And it was so powerful that, they, um, that MIT agreed and said, we're going to acknowledge this publicly. What was so striking about Nancy was um, the way she had gone about it. So she say she was the first person to start this, and then she joined with these other women. But um, but she said to me, well, I knew that I had less space, less lab space than the men in my building. And I said, well, how did you know? And she said, well, I measured. And I said, you measured? And she said, with a tape measure? <laughs> and I thought, really? And she said, yeah, I went around the building, and I measured every lab, and I measured every office. And I thought, oh, my God, here's this you know, I think she was 50 at the time, um, year old woman, tenure professor at MIT, crawling around buildings and measuring lab space. This is the length she had to go to to prove what was going on. Yeah, here she is fighting for, you know, very expensive equipment uh, for, you know, uh, her research. And at the same time, uh, a lot of this boils down to a tape measure, which I understand is kind of on display at MIT at this point. Is that right? Yes, at the MIT Museum. And again, yes, this is, you know, it's it's equipment, but we have to think about when we are asking, when we are requiring her to do this to prove her case, um, what are what is she missing and what are we missing in terms of the science that could be done in that time? And what is, you know, the distraction of all of this? Um, what are we missing in terms of what, what science she might be doing? Well, one of the things uh, that I found just so interesting as I've started reading a lot more about medical history uh, yeah. was just... Even in your first chapter, uh, here's a, a young woman who is working like literally at the epicenter of science and these discoveries about 
DNA and surrounded by all of these people that have eventually become Nobel Prize winners. Um, mm -hmm. And then you kind of start to go through her story. In, in the first chapter, like it's revealed that she was groped. Uh, and from there, you know, it's a chronicle of the challenges that she kind of faced and sometimes kind of brushed off. Do you think, you know, what she faced in that period of time was kind of unique to women in science? Is this kind of typical of what women were going through all over the country? So this is another way in that Nancy is sort of extraordinary. She falls in love with the study of DNA in a lecture by James Watson, four months after he and Francis Crick have been awarded the Nobel Prize for decoding the structure of DNA. And she is brave enough that she goes to Watson's lab and says, I want to work in your lab. And really, that took a, an extraordinary amount of courage for her. And she becomes Watson's protege. And he really mentors her. her. Um, but there were not a lot of women in that lab. And when Nancy looked around Harvard, she didn't have a single female professor. There weren't female professors. The women in science were working in the labs of their husbands. They weren't running their own labs. So Nancy thinks to herself, well, I'm not going to go get a PhD. That's a waste of time. All I want to do is do science. In the end, she sort of has to do a PhD because she's just so good that Watson insists that she don't do it. Um, but she was really extraordinary. There were not there were not women. It was really men running the labs, men making the big discoveries. So that you know, again, these women were just really unusual for their for their courage and being the only ones and being kind of limited by expectations around uh, their ability to you know work eighty hour weeks and do a yes. job while they have children, things like that. That uh, you know were not commonplace for women to do. Yeah, and part of it was just nepotism rules. You know, these universities couldn't hire, they wouldn't hire spouses. So of course, if you're only going to hire one spouse, who's going to get hired? It'll be the man. So the women were much more often um, going to be research associates in the labs of the men. They weren't going to be PhDs and they weren't going to be running their own labs. And I think the same was true in medicine. I think it was really hard for women to achieve that top level. Now, fast forward 30 plus years to 1999. For those of us of a certain age, I'll speak for myself, that doesn't seem so long ago, and it seems like modern times. But, uh, and, and you even say in your book, uh, gender discrimination seemed out of step with the times even then. But uh, explain what you mean by that and how these women's stories run counter to that perception. So again, you know, this is all, we were almost, almost at the turn of a new century, 1999. Um, I was 30. I thought my career was going pretty well. I thought opportunities were pretty open. Um, and then you started to think or, and listen to the ways these women had been, as they say, marginalized. And they defined this as 21st century discrimination, which I think is really why this story is so important and so powerful. It wasn't the obvious ways. There were some obvious ways in which the women were being discriminated against, things like, again, lab space, salaries. But for the most part, what really upset them were just the ways they'd been pushed aside. So, you know, it was the conversations that they were left out of that then becomes a collaboration that they're left out of, that then becomes a grant proposal that they're left out of. It's certain, you know, things within a university, like not knowing that you could get a loan sponsored by the university to, to buy an apartment. So these women were really, you know, struggling against the tide. Meanwhile, men were having their career paths paved for them. Um, so again, it was this, it was a, it was a subtle discrimination at the time. And now we take it so much for granted, but at the time we weren't talking about unconscious bias, but that's what these women identified. The first big paper on unconscious bias was actually in 1995, but again, we didn't have workplace training on that kind of thing. Now I think we look at unconscious bias and we're almost a little bit jaded. We sort of think, oh yeah, I know what that is. And I don't have any bias. But the reality is when you read a story like this, and when you talk to women, when you read their experience, you realize that we all do, and it's 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 systematic. It's through our system. And one of the reasons that I wrote this story, you mentioned that at the top about it's sort of like a novel. I wanted people to feel two things. I wanted them to feel what it's like to do science because it is thrilling, and I wanted them to appreciate the thrill of that work. But I also wanted them to understand what it feels like to be marginalized, to push, to be pushed aside, because I think it's important that we understand what unconscious bias feels like for those who are on this on the receiving end. You know, uh, back in the time that you kind of broke the story, it was mm -hmm. big news. It made kind of, you know, front page uh, of the Boston Globe. Were you surprised by the response you got to the article? I, 
everyone was surprised. I mean, so Bob Bergino, who's the dean of science, who helped these, who sort of became a hero to these women by fixing a lot of the problems. Um, he arrived in his office that the story broke on a Sunday. He arrived in his office on Monday. There was a CBS Evening News crew outside. Nancy walked into her office, picked up a phone. It was Australian radio on the other end. The New York Times put it on the front page. And really when the, you know, remember this is early days of the internet, pre-social media. Um, so the New York Times puts it on the front page and suddenly the whole world knows and the women were just flooded with emails saying, oh my God, I thought I was the only one. Um, you know, other women at other campuses, other, you know, a, a range of different institutions all saying, this is my experience, this is my life. Thank you for bringing this to light. Now it's 20 plus years later and your book is coming out. What do you hope that folks will take away from it? Well, again, I really hope that people will appreciate the thrill of science and appreciate the passion of these women, because, again, think of what we're losing out if we are shutting out 50 percent of our of our population right from the start. You know, if we're not being inclusive, what are the discoveries we're missing? But again, I also want people to appreciate what it feels like, why this why this discrimination persists and how you know, it's subtle. And how even subtle ways in um, in changing our thinking and changing our behavior can help the situation. But I want people to appreciate just how subtle the problem is by seeing Nancy's experience up close. Kate, in your epilogue, you talk about the progress that's been made, but you also acknowledge uh, that we still have a lot of work to do. Where do you think we stand today? And do you still consider women like this the exceptions? Yeah, you know, one of the reasons I chose the title The Exceptions is because when I was reporting People kept saying to me, you know, so and so is exceptional. Blah, blah, blah. But one thing someone did say to me was, and this is this is a Nobel Prize winner at a university in California saying, it is no longer exceptional for me to go pick up my kid at a daycare center and and see a pregnant woman. Like you didn't have daycare centers on these university campuses. Women weren't taking maternity leave. So now you see women in you know pregnancy clothes. They're not hiding their pregnancies anymore. So that has really changed. Certainly at MIT, MIT is now run by women from the head of the corporation to the president, to the you know, director of research, the dean of science. The city of Boston is run by a woman, the state of Massachusetts. So we have seen a lot of progress. On the other hand, in 2018, the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine uh, did a report that talked about discrimination and it, it surveyed women in the field. And it found that 50% of them had experienced some kind of discrimination. And the most prevalent kind of discrimination was not, you know, overt uh, sexual assault or even sexual coercion. It was the kind of discrimination these women were talking about. You know, the marginalization, the being pushed aside, the not being included in certain ways. And it's hard, I think, for women or for anyone who feels marginalized because you don't want to raise this point every time it, you know, you don't want to complain about every small thing. The trouble is the small things really do add up. Kate, thanks so much for being our first guest as part of the AMA Book Club. Folks out there, the book is called The Exceptions, and it's now widely, widely available for purchase. So uh, pick that up. It's really a fascinating read. Uh, we'll be back soon with another AMA update. You can find all our videos and podcasts at ama-assn.org slash podcasts. Thanks for joining us today. Please take care. <laughs>